personal responsibility, traditional values, a strong defense, and let the rest take care of itself. In terms of our future, uh, uh, thanks for mentioning it. Um, I tell people sometimes I got to read the papers every morning just to keep up with my intentions. Um, we've been very humbled uh, to be uh, uh, encouraged to seek higher office, um, both in Indiana and, and across the country. And uh, what I can tell you is my little family and I are nearing the end of a process. We've uh, taken the last few months to seek counsel from men and women that we, we respect. We're a family that believes in prayer uh, and deliberation. And uh, sometime before the end of the month, we're going we're gonna to make a decision about where we think uh, uh, we can make the most difference for the values that have carried us to public life. So I'll keep you posted. Did he answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll go to Tom in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thanks for waiting. Sure. Thanks, guys. And I appreciate uh, you spending taking my call. Uh, my question is simply a follow-up to a question that Sharp Young uh, gentleman asked earlier in the audience uh, referring to the uh, stock market collapse uh, that led to our current financial crisis. Uh, what I would like to know is simply this. Uh, what are we doing uh, to prevent a future collapse such as this where uh, it resulted primarily from the uh, non-regulation of derivatives market, which led to rampant fraud and uh, shady uh, mortgage lending practices, which led to the housing bubble uh, problem. And uh, the second part of that question is, is also this. Uh, What about the first part? Well, let me take the second part of the question first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's the right question, and, and I'm, I'm troubled. Like the second or the first? Uh, no, 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 the, the first question is what, what are we doing to prevent it from happening again? And I'm, I'm concerned that the answer to that would be what, the wrong things. We're doing the wrong things. The Dodd-Frank bill that was just signed uh, into law with a, a broad range of new financial regulations uh, actually uh, made permanent the power within the federal government to uh, practice the principles of too big to fail without ever having to come to the Congress in the future future administrations will have the ability to save firms that they determine to be too big to fail well to me that's a that's a permanent bailout authority and it takes us in exactly the opposite direction of personal responsibility um, I, I, I also, I, uh, uh, I've, I've been a very uh, uh, a strong critic uh, of uh, the Federal Reserve's a recent uh, second round of quantitative easing, QE2 as it's known. <clears throat> I just simply, I believe we cannot borrow and spend and bail our way back uh, to a growing America, and we also can't print money uh, as a means of, uh, of growing jobs in this country. I'm actually... Uh, we've been advocating and authored legislation, as my colleague Paul Ryan has also done for many years, that would that would refocus the Federal Reserve exclusively on uh, on on price protection, on preventing inflation, uh, rather than practicing what you all can look up later as they're called their dual mandate. Um, I, I think I think we 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 have got to keep the get the Federal Reserve back to being focused on protecting the dollar. And then we've got to look Washington, D.C., both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, right in the eye, and say, it's your job to grow this economy. It's your job to pursue the kind of tax relief and reform, the kind of uh, regulatory reform, the kind of uh, uh, expansion of, of uh, American uh, trade overseas, all the things that will create economic growth and jobs. That's Washington's job. Uh, it's the president's job. It's Congress's job. And, and I think we need to focus back there. And lastly, I, I do believe, as I said to the early, the first question, I think, we have got to get back to the notion that the freedom to succeed has to include the freedom to fail. And that, uh, that repealing Dodd-Frank, uh, or at least uh, repealing those aspects of Dodd-Frank that make permanent the, the policies of too big to fail, I think will be essential toward ensuring that that principle is back at the center of the American marketplace. Another question from one of the students here at the Washington Center for Representative Mike Pence. Uh, Chase Wright from University of San Diego. Hey, um, I was wondering, uh, in light of your beliefs in the necessity of accountability in the marketplace, will you support the elimination or actually propose the elimination of agricultural subsidies, including corn, ethanol, cotton, and sugar? 
Well, let me let me say. Um, um, and you represent an agricultural district. I do. Um, a lot of corn and soybeans out our way, and we're awful proud of it. Uh, I, yeah, I have I have supported um, uh, uh, if if we are going to have a mandate for fuel additives, I've I've supported uh, ethanol as the way of meeting that uh, rather than the previous chemical solution. But let me be very clear. As House Republicans uh, gather this week and work on our agenda and prepare to move forward, everything is on the table. Uh, there are no sacred cows. I was uh, that uh, I, I'm confident even that there are there are places that we can save in the contracting process uh, of our military budgets. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in a strong national defense. I think there's things that we should be doing that we're not doing, but I think we can find efficiencies in every aspect of uh, the American government. It means, it means uh, uh, domestic spending, uh, but also the really hard lift uh, is entitlement spending. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, the, the freight train of debt that is headed straight at your generation uh, is coming in the form of, of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Uh, and the higher taxes and the lower standard of living that your generation will face if we don't make decisions today to fundamentally transform those programs in a way that ensures fiscal solvency and, and leaves room for American economic growth. Um, uh, is very significant. So everything's on the table. Those subsidies are all on the table. Um, and um, uh, we're going to look for savings in domestic, but we're also going to look, uh, and I think you're going to see Republicans step forward with some, um, with some visionary and responsible reform uh, of entitlements going forward. The Washington Journal coming to you from the Washington Center at the corner of 3rd and K Street in Northeast Washington, D.C. Just a couple of blocks from the U.S. Capitol, we have uh, students representing more than 20 colleges and universities here in attendance. And our next call is Anthony in Long Island. Go ahead, please. Hi, Mr. Scully. Is it okay if I comment on the shooting in Arizona? Please go ahead. Um, I, my question is, we seem to always look at our problems from the inside out rather than the outside in. And I kind of... And I mean no, no insensitivity because I, I don't approve of any of this on either side of violence. But it seems to me as though this, this gentleman, this nut job, had inflicted what we could term um, shock and awe on the, um, the, the, those people at that rally. And I don't see the difference between, well, I do see a difference in what George Bush did to the Iraqi people who did nothing to us. And what this kid did, the only difference is, is this kid did his own dirty work, and George Bush was able to rise to power and manipulate our military to do what they did to their country. But it's, it's similar in that he disagreed with the policies of Saddam Hussein, so he, he got us into this crazy notion that we could go in and just start killing people. And, I mean, we've killed thousands in Iraq, and we're not analyzing that with such scrutiny, or, nor is it getting the coverage as did this, this whack job. And one more, most important point is Mr. Representative King is saying that he doesn't want people to come near uh, congressmen and senators with guns now. But what about the rest of us? I mean, violence is violence. I mean, we're all as, as worthy as a congressman or a senator. And I, I don't understand why did Homeland Security, which was another layer of government, was supposed to intercede in these instances. It failed. I mean, once again, we have another layer of bureaucracy that has failed us. Anthony, you put a couple of points on the table, but let me just go back. you think it's a fair analogy between what happened Saturday and the war in Iraq? But like I said, I'm, I'm not smart enough to really analyze it to the degree that maybe you gentlemen can, but I do believe that, you know, Iraq didn't really do as much to us. I mean, they, they, com they complied with the 12 years of sanctions. We disarmed them, and then when we, went, we went in with guns and blazing, and I do believe that the military was manipulated. I mean, George Bush rose to power from a civilian, let's say, and now had this kid, this 22-year-old man, got into politics and became the president, could he have ma manipulated our military to, to go after people he didn't like. I mean, okay, we'll get a lot of different levels there, but you can take it any direction you'd like. Well, the decision to go to war in Iraq is, is, uh, was, uh, um, was a result of, of, um, of years of Saddam Hussein rejecting the efforts by the international community 
to assure that he was not in the process of obtaining uh, chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it, it would be, I believe, in and around the late 90s that uh, Saddam Hussein ejected UN weapons inspectors entirely. Um, I was in Congress at the time. He was warned again and again and again. Uh, the final UN resolution that he rejected warned expressly from the UN Security Council that there were going to be serious consequences if he failed in a post-9-11 world uh, to open up uh, his uh, weapons programs to full inspection. The President of the United States of America made a decision uh, that, uh, that the possibility of Saddam Hussein possessing uh, weapons that could be used against uh, our citizens or our allies, uh, either directly or through third parties, was a clear and present danger to the United States of America. I supported that decision and make no apology for it. I would uh, say that to compare the decision of the United States of America to act uh, on behalf of uh, our citizens and our allies, to compare the actions of American soldiers to the despicable acts of last Saturday, is wrong. Next question, here at the Washington Center. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is George Hurley. I'm from the University of San Diego. And, um, Congressman, I actually overheard you in the bathroom this morning um, <laughs> make a comment about the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, could you discuss what uh, possibly what you were talking with your aide and uh, right. if you see a role in the, with the Fairness Doctrine coming up, being that our, our this week is, is talking about the, the politics and the media? <laughs> <laughs> Congressman. I'm going to stop for just a moment. Uh, uh, former Speaker, Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi is at the U.S. Capitol signing a book expressing condolences to those who lost their lives in Tucson and get well wishes for Representative Gabrielle Giffords. We'll watch for just a moment. The House Democratic leader at the U.S. Capitol, we should point out that Nancy Pelosi yesterday visited the uh, office of Representative Gabrielle Giffords to express her support to uh, the staff here in Washington, D.C. She is signing this book, her get well wishes to the Tucson area representative who remains in intensive care at University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi in the U.S. Capitol expressing her get well wishes for Representative Gabrielle Giffords. Yesterday she visited the Washington, D.C. office of the Tucson area Congresswoman. She will travel with the President as uh, we have live coverage tonight from the University of Arizona, a memorial service for those six who lost their lives and those still uh, injured, including the Tucson Congresswoman who does remain in intensive care at this hour at University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. 
We are back live at the Washington Center here on Capitol Hill, and our conversation on the Washington Journal continues with Representative Mike Pence, uh, first to this moment. Well, this is uh, obviously it's uh, um, one of the rays of sunshine that comes through this dark moment is uh, um, the discussions that we had on Sunday among, I think, every single member of Congress about uh, the uh, the sympathy and the prayers that we're all pouring forth on behalf of uh, of uh, Gabby, uh, her family, and the families of all those that have been affected. Uh, seeing a moment like that is uh, uh, moving to me not as a public official, but just as a uh, uh, as a as a as a colleague uh, of uh, of uh, Congresswoman Giffords. This is a uh, this is a time, as House Speaker John Boehner said, where uh, an attack on one is an attack on all. And he said, "This this is a while we see the worst of humanity in this moment." And this is an opportunity for the American people to see the best of Congress, which is, uh, and I saw that in other moments. Um, the in the immediate aftermath of September the 11th, um, you know, there were no Republicans on Capitol Hill, there were no Democrats on Capitol Hill, they were just Americans. And th there, there is, um, there are these moments where we are reminded that despite our, our real and vigorous differences on philosophy and on the course and direction of government. That, that we are all Americans. Uh, we're all sons and daughters. Many of us have the privilege of being moms and dads, grandmothers and grandfathers, and the human element uh, of this tragedy reaches us all. It reaches us all equally and, and reminds the American people that we're all in this together. We only have a minute or two left, but uh, to go back to the earlier question posed by one of the students from the University of South uh, uh, San it's Diego. It's a great, great question. Fair I'm stop. glad I mentioned it in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> I authored uh, several years ago the Broadcaster Freedom Act, and we're going to be working with Congressman Greg Walden to introduce that legislation again. It was in a similar time of blaming the debate. The efforts at amnesty uh, had faltered in the Senate, and it was actually... Uh, members of both political parties who were saying, well, we would have been able to pass this, this was in the press, but for talk radio or but for the debate. And I heard, I heard one prominent member of the Senate say, we've got to do something about the debate. And that's when I authored the Broadcaster Freedom Act, which would take the power away from the Federal Communications Commission forever to impose the censorship known as the Fairness Doctrine that was the law for decades in America. Believe it or not, from the outset of the radio business all the way to the Reagan years, radio stations lived under, broadcast radio stations lived under content regulation. Eventually it was litigated, went to the Supreme Court uh, in the famous Red Lion case. Uh, it was, the speech restrictions were upheld, but eventually they were done away with, and the explosion of the debate on the airwaves of America, left, right, and center, uh, has been a great benefit to this country. Uh, and already this morning, I saw that there are some prominent members of Congress saying we, in the wake of this tragedy, uh, a tragedy, the responsibility for which falls squarely on one individual who engaged in these unspeakable acts, that somehow the debate itself now needs more regulation. I, I leave you with the thought Thomas Jefferson said, and it's, to me it's emblematic of what C-SPAN is all about. Um, because this, uh, this great network, founded by Brian Lamb of Indiana, um, is about giving the American people access, uh, free and open access to our government in all of its various ways and practices. Thomas Jefferson said something, and I'll paraphrase it. He said, given the choice between a nation that had a free press but no government versus a government but no free press, he said, I, I, I would choose the former that a free and independent press is essential to our way of life. Uh, and that the, the very nature of the public debate, as rough and tumble as it can become, uh, is, is, I believe, the very nucleus of our national greatness. Americans' ability to express themselves freely, support candidates they choose to support, is the very essence of self-government. And we have to preserve it. And so we'll be introducing the Broadcaster Freedom Act in the very near term. 
and we'll be prepared to fight in every way uh, to ensure uh, that uh, our freedom of speech is, is not one more casualty of what the tragic events in Tucson. Congressman Pence, let me conclude with one point. Uh, we talked earlier about your political career. What questions are you asking yourself to determine whether you want to run for governor of Indiana or possibly president? Personally, what are you asking yourself? Well, obviously, my, the highest office I serve in is, is uh, husband and father. Um, I'm the father of, uh, of three kids, all teenagers. So I know how much trouble you people are. Uh, been married 25 years. So I don't, I don't ask these questions in light of, of what's right for me. I ask them first in, in the context of what's right for our, our family. And, and secondly, it's, for us, we want to ask the question always, where are we needed most? And where, where is, is our, our, uh, our, our God-given uh, talents, our background, our experience, uh, our belief in a strong defense, limited government, traditional moral values, um, where is our brand of leadership needed the most? I mean, that, to me, is what servant leadership is all about. It's not about what do I want to do, but, it, but it's about where am I needed most. And so I would, and that's what I challenge everyone in this room. All of you are aspiring leaders. I can see it in your eyes. And I'm encouraged for the future of the country looking around this room. But I want to tell you, challenge yourself to think about servant leadership. Challenge yourself to think about asking the question, where am I needed most? And if you do that in a way that puts your faith and your family first, America will be better for it. Congressman Mike Pence, on behalf of the students here at the Washington Center, thank you very much for being with us here on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Thanks, everybody.